Folks, we're going to get underway here, if you don't mind. And uh, Glow Cunningham has asked me to get her up here and make an announcement or whatever she wants to do. Well, I just wanted to say I have a book list, and I want to let you know that a lot of those books are at the museum, so I'm doing a plug. But in actual fact, the big plug is because I said something to waste, so I'm not going to tell people to buy my books. I'm telling you to buy this book, okay, because I can do that. And so, yeah, support Dwayne and the museum has them. And if you uh, have a membership, you get 10% off. And if you don't have a membership, you could be a member, and then you could still get 10% off. So uh, that's my cheerleader speech. Bye-bye. Good, thank you. Thank you, Glow. For those of you who uh, have just come in, I brought a bunch of books up that deal with Crested Butte. So we're going to take a little break around 45 minutes in to give everybody a break from me. Uh, one of them, Sandy Cortner, Crested Butte Stories Through My Lens. Some of you may have these books. Uh, Where the Road Ends, Sandy Fails, Crested Butte, Return to My Avalon, John Tezak. Reflections on a Western Town, Kelsey Wirth, that's Tim Wirth's daughter. She did that as a thesis. When Coal Was King by Dwayne Smith. Thank you. I was wondering where that book went. I was about ready to frisk somebody. Uh, Elk Mountain Odyssey, a lot of you folks remember Paul Anderson when he was here. And uh, Crested Butte, The End of Paradise, uh, Nathan Below, and uh, Sandy Fails. So I'll just put these up here. If anybody wants to take a look at them, uh, please do. Uh, one more thing. Uh, one of the things we're going to talk about today is Irwin. This is going to set the stage for Crested Butte, so to speak. And one of the uh, people who did a master's thesis for me a number of years ago was Walt Borneman. And this is a, the absolute definitive word on Irwin, Silver Camp of the Ruby Mountains. Uh, 230 pages, pictures, great bibliography. Walt lives in Estes Park, and he's gone on to become one of the top 10 historians in the United States. Been on C-SPAN and goes on uh, television shows and so on, and a uh, heck of a good man. So anyway, that is that. Uh, next week when we come here, uh, Dr. Bruce Bartleson is going to come up with me, and he's got a great slideshow on the geological history of Crested Butte. And it's very good. So he will spend most of the time, probably not all of the time, at 7 o'clock with that. Um, Crested Butte stuff I've already shown, and I think... oh. Uh, the other thing is, if anybody has any of my books and wants me to sign them, I'd be very happy to do that. A couple of people came up last time. If you've got them with you, bring them up and I'll be happy to sign. All right, here we go. Today what I want to do is start off with about one minute on Crested Butte coal before I go on to some other things. We'll be back to Crested Butte in depth down the line. Um, very early, Ferdinand Vandeveer Hayden, the great explorer, was in this area in 1874. And the year before, Sylvester Richardson, one of the fathers of the Gunnison country, was here in 1873 with the John Parsons Geological Expedition. When the Geological Expedition left in late September, Sylvester Richardson stayed. And he walked 500 miles, and he found the coal deposits in Crested Butte. He found the coal deposits in Ohio Creek. He found Leadville limestone on White House Mountain at Marble, some of the great marble deposits in the world. And he just became infatuated with the area. So very early, there were people who knew that coal was here. A couple of brothers named, named uh, Jennings in 1877 came in here, and they filed claims on some coal lands. One year later, they are bought out by Howard F. Smith and Sant Robinson. That's why we got Smith Hill, and that's why we got the Robinson coal mine as we start coming into Crested Butte. If you look on the left side of the road, you'll see three black splotches up on the left side of the road, and those are the Buckley, the Littell, or the, there's another name for it too, the Pueblo mine, and then uh, the other one is the mine that Howard Smith and Sant Robinson developed, and that was the Robinson Mine. Uh, in 
1880, Robinson and Smith sold out to the Colorado Coal and Iron Company. Twelve years later, the Colorado Coal and Iron Company will be known as the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company out of Pueblo, the famous CF&I. So they bought the land that the big mine is on, and the Jokerville mine was on, and they bought a lot of other properties that had a lot of coal on the land at that time. In the late 1870s, one great silver camp opened up after another in the Gunnison country and in Colorado. And one of the big myths is that coal made Crested Butte. It did eventually. But that is not what brought the people into Crested Butte or anywhere else in the Gunnison country. The thing that brought them in was silver and gold. Nobody was very interested in coal at the outset. So White Pine springs up and Gothic springs up and Tin Cup springs up and Pitkin springs up and Irwin springs up and probably 50 other camps all with great dreams with names like O.B. Joyful and Tucson and Pittsburgh and Schofield and Crystal and, and others. So here we go. The next topic I want to talk about, and we're setting the stage for what we're going to do a little bit later on, and we really get into depth in Crested Butte, is talk about the railroad coming in and railroads coming into Crested Butte and up Ohio Creek. And that is the story of William Henry Jackson, or excuse me, William J. Palmer, the man who started the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad. Born in Delaware, 1909, member of a Quaker family, very uh, aristocratic, uh, became a general for the North in the Civil War, and four years after the Civil War ended, he married a young lady who was 17 years younger than he was, named Mary Queen Mellon. And Mary Queen Mellon was of the famous Mellon Steel family, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So she, in her own right, was very wealthy. And on their honeymoon, they went to London. And while they were in London on their honeymoon, William Jackson Palmer looked in the newspaper and found out that a guy named Robert Fairley was going to deliver a talk that night to the British Locomotive Association and the title of the talk was going to be Rails of the Future. So Palmer gave his new bride $200 and sent her shopping in London and he went to the British Locomotive Association meeting on his honeymoon. And there Robert Fairley began to talk about something that the U.S. was not familiar with at all. But England was and Europe was and the, that involved narrow gauge railroads. Narrow gauge railroads with track three feet wide. As opposed to broad gauge railroads or standard gauge railroads where the tracks are four feet eight and a half inches. And I may have mentioned that last time but the reason that all broader or standard gauge railroads are four feet eight and a half is that the federal government passed a law that said that all tracks outside of the narrow gauges in the mountains had to be four feet eight and a half inches. Otherwise, you got some guy with five feet, another guy with four feet, another guy with four six, and the damn trains couldn't connect with each other. Here were the advantages that William Jackson Palmer heard Robert Fairley talk about, and he listened with great interest. Number one said fairly, the advantage of a narrow gauge railroad is that they are very utilitarian in the mountains. They can go up steeper grades, they can go around sharper curves. One big advantage. Second big advantage is that they could get into mining camps first. So, if a mining camp opens up and you want to get in first to get all the traffic, you can't be screwing around with a broad gauge railroad because if a narrow gauge railroad beats you in, they get the traffic. Early bird gets the worm. The third major advantage, said Robert Fairley, was that the narrow gauge railroads were easier to finance. And they were easier to finance because they didn't cost as much. So it's easier to raise capital. And the fourth major reason is that you could use 30-pound rails and you could have a lot less ballast. 
In other words, in the mountains, you didn't have to have a very wide base. So William Jackson Palmer listened to this, came home, and he started the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad in 1870, one year later. Narrow Gauge Railroad, which became very unique in the history of the West for two reasons. Number one, it was narrow gauge. And the U.S. hadn't seen very many narrow gauge railroads. Certainly none that ran as far as Palmer's. And a second major unique thing was that that railroad ran north and south. Now you look on a map and tell me how many interstate highways run north or south or how many big railroad lines run north and south, and I can probably count them on the fingers of one hand. Almost all railroads and almost all roads run east and west, as in Interstate 40, Interstate 50, Interstate 70, Interstate 80, and Interstate 90. Now there are a couple that go north and south, but not many. What Palmer hoped to do with the Denver and Rio Grande was run from Denver to Mexico City, tapping out all of the mineral wealth on the west side of the railroad, all the great mining camps going up on the west side of the railroad, and tapping into all the great farming communities now being developed on the east side of the road. And he would finish up in Mexico City, hence the name the Denver and Rio Grande, because he was going to follow the Rio Grande for part of the route along towards Mexico City. William Jackson Palmer built from Denver, and he headed immediately to the south. And when he got about 50, 60 miles to the south, he laid out a new town. And if you go into this town today, you can see General Palmer on horseback right on the middle of Nevada Avenue. And you can go to the Palmer House. And you can visit Palmer High School. And you can go to Palmer Park. And you can visit his house at Glen Airy. And you can visit the Antlers Hotel, named for all the animals who shot. And then he took the antlers and put them in the hotel. And you can go to the Broadmoor. William Jackson Palmer was not interested in Colorado City, which existed before Colorado Springs. As you're coming into Colorado Springs on Highway 24, on the left side of the road on 31st Street, if you go about two blocks over, that's Colorado City, which was later on incorporated into Colorado Springs. Palmer did not like the drinking, did not like the prostitution, didn't like the gambling. In short, he did not like the riffraff. He was an aristocrat. And as a result, Colorado Springs became known as Little London, or the new port of the Rockies. Now Palmer's got his town, and he builds further south. And another 40 miles or so, 45 miles away, he comes to a town called Pueblo. And he becomes the main owner of the Colorado Coal and Iron Company. And what he wants to do is make Pueblo the Pittsburgh of the West. Because he knows if he's going to build railroads, he better have the steel to build the railroads. So he builds Pueblo, helps build Pueblo up. And now at Pueblo, he's been going from Denver to Colorado Springs to Pueblo South. And now when he got to Pueblo, he headed west. And he headed west to a town called Florence. And then he came to the town known as Canyon City. And at Canyon City, there was an eight-mile-long royal gorge, 953 feet deep. And there's only room for one railroad to go through the royal gorge. Palmer wanted the road, but so did the Santa Fe Railroad. The Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe. Whenever I say that term, when I was in high school, uh, we always dated other school's cheerleaders. And I dated a girl named Joanne Lundquist, hell of a nice girl. And she was a cheerleader for Rapid River. Anybody know B.C. Vandevoort? That's where hell his family's from, Rap Rapid River, about 15 miles from where I grew up. And they had a cheer, and I've never forgotten it. It came right out of the song in the movie, and it goes... The Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe, and they made a, a nice song about it. 
And you could just hear those damn wheels starting to spin as they said the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe. There's not room for two rails in the bottom of the Royal Gorge. So from 1874 to 1878, the Royal Gorge War ensued. Bat Masterson and other gunfighters were hired. Tracks were ripped up. Both sides ripped up the other's tracks. Both sides shot at each other. Both sides rolled rocks on each other. And finally, in 1878, this thing went into litigation. And the courts looked at it from 1878 to 1880. And in 1880, the Boston Treaty was signed. And both the Santa Fe and the Rio Grande got a little of what they wanted. The Rio Grande got the right to build through the Royal Gorge. The Santa Fe got the right to build over Raton Pass, New Mexico, and go into Santa Fe. Rio Grande wasted no time. They immediately built through the Royal Gorge, came through Cotopaxi, came through South Arkansas City and Cleora, now known as Salida, the exit, and then they followed the Arkansas River, and on July the 23rd, 1880, they arrived in Leadville, Colorado. That's the spot they wanted to get to, and that's why the Royal Gorge route was so important, because Leadville had 30,000 people and was the biggest city in Colorado and one of the greatest mining towns in the West and desperately needed a railroad. It now had the narrow-gauge Santa Fe. The Rio Grande now would build a main line. This is just a little branch line. And the main line was now going to be built over a parallel pass to Monarch Pass, and that is over Marshall Pass. Poncha Springs over to Sargent's. And Palmer bought out Otto Mears Toll Road. When Otto Mears built his first toll road, from Sawatch to California Gulch, soon to be Leadville in the late 1860s, there was no road but he wanted to get all of his grain and all of his uh, meat and everything into California Gulf so he could make a lot of money. So he builds a toll road, Poncha Pass Toll Road. And while he's building the toll road, he is met by the ex-governor of Colorado, William Gilpin. And William Gilpin walked up to Otto Mears and he said, Sonny, he said, I'm going to give you a little piece of advice here. When you build those toll roads, Sonny, don't build them more than a 4% grade because the railroads are coming, son, and when they do, you'll be able to sell your toll road out for a railroad route. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. And as a result, here comes the Rio Grande Railroad built by Austrian and Italian laborers up the east side of Marshall Pass topping out at 10,846 feet down the west side in Marshall Creek and into a town called Marshallton. The name changed one year later because Joe Sargents had some land and he was the postmaster. So everybody began to call it Sargents, which it is today. And then down the Tamichi Valley came the Rio Grande to Crookston, Doyleville, Parlin, and on August the 6th, 1881, arrived in Gunnison. Big party. Lasted six hours. After the party was over, the Rio Grande wasted no time and immediately built 28 miles north to Crested Butte where the coal and silver mines beckoned, especially silver. Going right through Almont, where Sam Fisher had a toll bridge, Jack's Cabin, Glacier, and on November the 21st, 1881, arrived in Crested Butte, Narrow Gauge Railroad. Not only did they build up into Crested Butte, but that railroad kept right on going to the west and built through 15 miles of the Black Canyon and went to Montrose and all the way to Grand Junction heading for the West Coast. 
and obviously keeping Mexico City in mind. That's the Rio Grande. While the Rio Grande is building, they have a big challenger. And the big challenger is a railroad started by the governor, the ex-governor of Colorado, John Evans. John Evans, very unique guy in Colorado history. When he died, his body was the first one ever to lay in state at the Colorado State Capitol. Born at Fort Dearborn. Later on, Fort Dearborn be known as Chicago. His family bought up all kinds of land. And you can imagine how much money they made from speculation by buying up that land. John Evans' family started a great university led by John himself in a suburb of Chicago known as Evanstown, Evanston. What, what great university is located in Evanston? Northwestern. Northwestern, one of the great private universities. When he came to Colorado, he laid out Colorado Seminary, which became the University of Denver. The only guy I know of with two great private universities laid out by him. Number one Methodist in the country, governor of Colorado, number one Republican in the state of Colorado, very prominent guy, and he starts a railroad called the Denver South Park and Pacific. Narrow gauge. Building from Denver to Morrison, up the Platte River, topping out at Kenosha Pass, then through South Park, through Jefferson, Como, and Fairplay, then over Trout Creek Pass and into where Johnson's Village is today, and then up Chalk Creek to Romley, Hancock, St. Elmo, and the east side of the Continental Divide. And there, about 500 feet below Altman Pass, John Evans and the South Park and Pacific Railroad built the Alpine Tunnel. 1,771 feet long, 11,523 feet in elevation, highest railroad tunnel in the world. 10,000 men at one time or another worked on that railroad. None lasted more than three or four days. Conditions in the winter, unbelievable. 50, 60 mile an hour winds, 20 degree below zero temperatures, huge drifts. They had to spend more time shoveling snow than they did building the tunnel for a while. Two sides of the tunnel. Guys are building on the east side at a construction camp called Atlantic. On the west side of the tunnel are building from a side called Pacific. And they build in, and when they came into the middle, they were 11 one hundredths of an inch off. One million board feet of lumber and an additional 300,000 board feet of redwood timber in the Alpine Tunnel. Now in the old days, uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago after I got here, uh, I've been in that tunnel five or six times. And if you had claustrophobia, you could never go in because you had to slide down an opening like this on the west side about 20 feet, and then you could walk. And carbide lamps, hip boots, there's a little water in there. And the first time I got to the bottom and I turned my head to the left, I almost had a heart attack because the walls are filled with giant white algae that look like eight-foot high spiders. And you could walk about two-thirds of the way through the tunnel where a slide had come in so you couldn't walk out the east side. But there was one magic spot in the tunnel where you took two pieces of paper and you put them right next to each other with water flowing in the tunnel and one of them floated west and one of them floated east. And that was the exact continental divide in the Alpine Tunnel. So water would run out on both sides. Down the South Park came, down the Palisades. Fantastic rock work, no mortar. To Quartz, to Pitkin, to Parlin, to Gunnison, September 3rd, 1882. Wasted no time. It went right up Ohio Creek, and it went up Ohio Creek to a town called Castleton, where Glenn Dubin, a billionaire, has done unbelievable things with that ranch that he's got. 
And then it built to a place called King's Ranch, which we're going to talk about. And it ultimately ended at the town of Baldwin. What the South Park wanted to do was build into Irwin, but the boom had ended. So you can still see the rock work. Some of you may have walked along the rock work. They graded all the way into Irwin, but it never got past Baldwin. That was a coal mining town, and that's where it pretty much ended. So two railroads are now in the Gunnison country. A little aside to this right now, for a long time people believed that the Gunnison country, and I've heard this 70-day growing season, tremendously cold weather, no way you can raise farm produce in the Gunnison country. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Before the railroads, they had to raise agricultural produce because you couldn't go to City Market or Safeway and stock up. Now, I got a great talk on sustainability. A lot of this deals with Crested Butte, but I'll hold off on that. But I'll give you a quick blurb. And I got the guy's uh, memoirs right here. I talked to you last time about Harry Cornwall, who grew up, uh, who uh, became a mining engineer in Irwin. And then his father went to Ohio Creek, and when he planted a garden at Ohio Creek, all the ranchers laughed at him. The guy's from New York, you know what the hell he's doing. Have you ever heard of a 70-day growing season? But George Cornwall didn't know he wasn't supposed to be able to raise a garden. And everything came up beautifully. Carrots, parsnips, beans, peas. Ranchers came, he said in the memoirs, from 20 miles away to see the garden. From that time on, every rancher raised a garden. And the big myth is that you cannot raise agricultural produce in the Gunnison country, and we're starting to do it now. And you can be sustainable. When I grew up on my farm in Upper Michigan, I was in charge of the garden, among other things. But the garden was my pride and joy. No rocks, no weeds, no nothing. Spotless. The only problem was my mother used to get on me because, and I still like it today, I don't like cooked food too much, cooked vegetables. So Vanna Bush is out there squeezing the peas out of the pot and eating them raw and they're delicious. Cleaning the dirt off the carrots, eating them raw. Eating the tomatoes. Scraping the dirt off the potatoes and eating the new potatoes, the little ones. And then I was also chewing some grain, usually. And all these hot shots that uh, believe in health and fitness today, they tell us that's the way to go. I was way ahead of my time, way ahead of my time. Didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I was way ahead of my time. A couple of other narrow gauge railroads I want to mention just quick like, had nothing to do with the Gunnison country. The first one in the history of Colorado ran from Golden to Central City, Georgetown, and all the way to Silver Plume, Colorado Central. You still ride a little bit of that today. You go to Georgetown, you can hop on a train, and you can go to Silver Plume, 2.7 miles away, with two big loops. Name of that railroad is Georgetown Loop. <laughs> and the reason they had a loop is that from Georgetown to Silver Plume, three miles up the canyon, Clear Creek Canyon, is only 600 foot elevation gain, but you gotta make that in three miles, and it was too steep to go straight up. So a guy named Robert Blixendurfer, who was in the Black Canyon and also up in this area, he said the way to do this is to loop. You go like this up a 2% grade, and you come back here, 2% grade, and by looping, the railroad, the Georgetown Loop, goes 4.7 miles to make up the three. It couldn't go straight up the canyon. You can still ride it today. Anybody ridden the Georgetown Loop? It's a great ride. And the other one's the most fantastic railroad ever built in Colorado. If you go to Georgetown, this railroad ran from Georgetown to the top, almost to the top of McClellan Peak at 13,700 feet. 
and was called the Argentine Central Railroad. Just absolutely unbelievable. It had a Shea engine. Shea means that you can, it's not geared, you can, you can go up steeper grades with a Shea. Enough on that. We now go to a new topic. New topic is load mining. Last time I talked to you about placer mining. Placer mining, obviously gold panning, and that is free gold. Shot, wire, grain, dust, nugget, flour. When you got that stuff, you put it in your saddlebags and right away. It doesn't need any smelting, nothing like that. But as all of you know, by the year 1869 or 70, this era was over in the history of the Gunnison country in Crested Butte. All the streams had been panned out, the Indians had become dangerous, and on top of that, we were so damn far in the boondocks, it was hard to get supplies in here for a long time. Starting in the 1870s, we began to hear about load mining, better known as hard rock mining, better known as quartz mining. Now this started even before we got to the western slope of Colorado. Whenever you engage in load mining, you are going down into the bowels of the earth, 500 or 1,000 feet, and then you are engaging what we call crisscrossing or coyoting. Anybody who plays tic-tac-toe knows what I'm talking about. Here's a 1,000-foot shaft going straight down here, 500 feet away, another 1,000-foot shaft going straight down, and then every 100 feet down, you got tunnels. Tic-tac-toe. What are you trying to find? You are trying to find the, quote, mother load. You're trying to intersect the vein of the mother load. And when you do, you follow it. Now, obviously, this takes a lot more money and a lot more men and a lot more technology. So the day of the individual miner is now over. No individual miner's got that kind of money or technology or manpower to engage in mining. Unfortunately, that's the way you got to get the gold, the silver, the zinc, the lead, and the copper out. Now there's a lot more wealth deep below the ground than was ever in the streams, but it's going to be a lot tougher to get out and it ain't free gold. Now I brought with me a metallurgist report of 1863, and this is so true of Colorado and the Gunnison country. Quote, Colorado has the toughest ore in the nation to process. We doubt if any other state can afford a more complete and varied study for the metallurgist. Its gold and silver is found nearly always associated with iron and copper. Its silver is, in a majority of cases, carried in lead and zinc ores, often with a mixture of antimony and arsenic. Were only one or two of these present, the difficulties would not be so great. As it is, however, a very small number of mines yield rock that can be properly handled in any other way than by a long and expensive and complicated process. Keep those words in mind. Long, expensive, and complicated, and for a long time, it looked like it couldn't be done. By 1864, ghost towns appeared in Colorado. The amount of money that Colorado produced went down by one half because nobody could figure out how to reduce the damn ore. And now in the year 1867, the Boston and Colorado Mining Company out of the east sent a trained metallurgist out here, a brilliant guy from Johns Hopkins University, and his name was Nathan Hill. And he visited the Boston and Colorado mine at Blackhawk. And Nathan Hill took samples from the mine. And he took the samples by wagon to Denver, from Denver by wagon to the Midwest, by rail from St. Louis to the East Coast, and then on board ship three weeks to Wales, where the best miners in the world existed. 
The Welsh miners have been mining tin for 700 years. Cousin Jack's the best there was. And Nathan Hill said, if these guys can't reduce it, it can't be reduced. The Welsh miners found out that you could concentrate the gold onto a copper mat or a copper base. They didn't make the final reduction because they didn't have enough time to do it and maybe they couldn't do it. So Nathan Hill took all that ore back, went back to Colorado, six years later after all kinds of tests. Nathan Hill was able not only to put the gold reduced onto a copper mat, but was able to completely separate it and get the gold and silver out of it. And the famous Boston and Colorado smelter was the first smelter in Colorado that worked. Nathan Hill became a multimillionaire. He became a United States Republican senator from the state of Colorado. And I tell my classes, there is no man in Colorado history ever been more important than Nathan Hill. Because without him, the Colorado gold rush was dead in the water. Wouldn't have, wouldn't have made it. Here are the ways that the Gunnison country and Colorado and the western slope reduced the ore. Uh, one of the very primitive ways, very early, the Spanish used this, was an arastra. So we got a perfect spot for an arastra, and some were about this size, some bigger. You got a bunch of flat rocks you lay on the ground, and then you dump all of the debris on top of these flat rocks. The debris, I mean the muck and the mud and the rocks and so on, and you think there's gold in this. And then you got a pole going right up in the middle. And on top of the pole, you got a two by four, and the two by four swivels. And on each end of the two by four, you got a chain that goes all the way down, connected onto a big rock on both sides. And a mule all day is tied on to that chain or rock, and all day he walks around the arastra, scraping the two big heavy rocks over the debris in the middle and reducing it by friction to rubble. That is a Spanish arastra. Now, before we even go on to the others, I'm going to tell you right now that in the old days in the Gunnison country, they said $200 to the ton is good gold. And you say, now what does that mean? That means that you bring up one ton of debris. Rocks, dirt, everything. Gold sold at 20 an ounce at that time. 10 ounces times $20 is 200, right? One ton of debris, and in there are 10 ounces of gold that is good gold. Your job is to find it. And it's not easy. And here's the way they did it outside of the arastra. One of these techniques was known as a stamp mill. And they had them all over the Gunnison country. If you go to Pitkin, right on the right side of the road as you're going into Pitkin, you can see the Roosevelt 10 stamp mill. In the San Juan, I always wish I could have seen it, they had 100 stamp mills at the Sunnyside Mine and the Gold Prince. Now here is a stamp mill, ladies and gentlemen. A stamp mill means that you dump all the ore into a bin. And now you've got 10 stamps right above that bin. And they're like pistons on a car. You've got a big metal pole going up. And on the bottom of that metal pole, just like at a post office, you've got a metal stamp, circular metal stamp. If you got a 10 stamp mill, one, three, five, seven, and nine, bam, smashing into the crusher of the debris. Two, four, six, eight, and 10 are going up. Then two, four, six, eight, and 10 come down. Bam, 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 just like pistons on a car. Smashing into that rock and debris and reducing it to dust or rubble. Still haven't made the final separation. 
We'll get to that in a moment. That's that's second way you reduce the or. Third way you reduce the or is through the use of a ball mill. Anybody who goes to a working mine or even a non-working mine, you, you walk into a, on the side of a working mine and you're going to see little metal balls about that big around. Stacks of them. A ball mill means that you got a container that is uh, 50 feet long, 20 feet up and down. And you put all the debris and the rocks inside of that metal cylinder. And then you put eight pound metal balls, shot puts in with them. I was at the AMAX mine one time and held eight semis coming in with those metal balls because they use them in the AMAX company's stamp mill or uh, ball mill. And then with electrical power or steam power, you begin to turn that cylinder. And that cylinder turns around faster and faster, and the metal balls are smashing into the debris and the rocks and reducing it to dust or rubble. The fourth mill you have is the same as the third, except this is called a rod mill. And instead of balls, you've got metal rods this big around, about seven feet long, and you put them in the cylinder and then spin the cylinder. Now, after you reduce this to rubble, and I, one of the great trips I ever had was last winter. Uh, Bartleson and I uh, know a guy that is a geology major at Western, was a geology major at Western. He is in charge of the Cripple Creek gold mine, the Crescent Mine. It's open pit now. It produces $300 million a year. $300 million. It's one of the great gold strikes in the history of the United States. Out of Ely, Nevada, Battle Mountain, Nevada, they got the Carlin trend. Two billion a year comes out of there. Nothing's ever seen, been seen like that in the history of the United States. It's called no gold, microscopic gold. They mine the dumps because their recovery methods are a lot better today and they get gold that they were never able to get then. They use cyanide process. So here we are at Cripple Creek. They got trucks that cost $3 million. <clears throat> the tires on these trucks cost 70000 The trucks hold 240 to 270 tons. They come in and dump their, their loads into a huge crusher. I'm in the, the, right next to the guy who's watching all this as these trucks drop stuff in. Any rock that is too big to go through the crusher, this guy's got a computer and he's got a jackhammer. And he runs the controls and that jackhammer goes right to the rock and bam, 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 and knocks the rock into smaller pieces. And then all of the debris is is smashed into six inch pieces. And a conveyor belt takes it into another crusher and it goes into three inch pieces. And from three inch pieces, it goes into another crusher and now it's dust. And now comes the chemical process and the water process to separate it. Now I'm at the climax, molybdenum mine, and I'm an old farmer, I wanna touch stuff. And I'm at the flotation table. And it's just amazing, I don't know how they do it. Once the water is on the flotation table, just a little skiff of it, And one stream about an inch long, out comes the molybdenum. Six inches beyond that comes another strip of zinc. Another six inches, a stream of copper. Another six inches, a stream of lead. Coming right out on the flotation table. Unbelievable. The gold is then made into a candy kiss out at Cripple Creek, 80 pound candy kiss. Looks just like candy kiss you eat. 80 pounds at $1,300 an ounce. That's a lot of money, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) Anybody has a chance to go and watch that operation, boy, I got an education, a big education. 
There is a great book, if anybody is interested, written by a guy named James Fell, F-E-L-L, and it's called Ores to Metals. And it takes you through the process from ore to metal by going through the process by which they make the separation. Now a little, little bit of a history lesson here that has a lot to do with Crested Butte. After the United States Civil War and before the Civil War, the United States was on a bimetallic standard, which means we coined both silver and gold. At the time of the California gold rush, there were more gold mines in the nation than silver. Silver really hadn't opened up yet. And as a result, any silver you would never sell it to the federal government because it only brought a buck and a quarter an ounce. You take it to a silversmith or you take it to a jewel maker and you get three fifty dollars an ounce because there's not very much of it. The ratio traditionally between gold and silver is 16 to 1, which means silver, gold is 16 times more valuable than silver. And the reason for that is Gresham's law that the dearer the metal, the more expensive it is. The less of what you have, if you have less of something, it's more important and more expensive than if you got a lot of something. So gold sells at 20 an ounce, silver sells at a buck and a quarter. 16 times a buck and a quarter equals 20. And then silver mines began to open up. Comstock Lode, Nevada. Georgetown, Leadville. In 1873, and I mean, I had a seminar on this whole damn thing at Oklahoma State, so I won't go into all of it, but in 1873, the United States government passed the Coinage Act, and the Coinage Act said they weren't going to coin silver anymore. There's a lot of reasons for that. The bankers didn't want it, the conservatives didn't want it, the world didn't want it. And as a result, with all that new silver coming out on the market, the price of silver began to drop. And in 1893, it got down to 58 cents an ounce. And at that price, you really couldn't make it. One of the great inventions, in the, or one of the great elections in the history of the United States came in 1896, and it involved what became known as the Battle of the Standards. On one hand, you got the people who want silver. Miners in the West, poor people generally because there's more of it and more inflation, Democratic Party. On the other hand, you got the gold guys, the bankers, the conservatives, and primarily the Republicans and the big city guys. And running for the Republican Party is a guy named William McKinley on the gold standard. Running for the Democrats and the populists is William Jennings Bryan, the boy orator of the Platte River. And Bryan delivered one of the three greatest speeches in the history of the United States in the convention in Chicago in 1896. Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, yes. John Kennedy's inaugural 1960, yes. And now William Jennings Bryan, and I'm going to take a moment to tell you what he said to the people in the convention. You come to us and tell us that the great cities are in favor of the gold standard. We reply that the great cities rest upon our broad and fertile prairies. Burn down your cities and leave our farms, and your cities will spring up again as if by magic but destroy our farms and the grass will grow in the streets of every city in the country. Having behind us the producing masses of the nation and the world, supported by the commercial interests, the laboring interests, and the toilers everywhere, we will answer their demand for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns, you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Cross a gold speech by Bryan. Unfortunately, in the election, McKinley won in a squeaker, and that was it. Silver was done forever. 
which means Irwin, White Pine, Gothic, Pitkin, and Tin Cup are done forever. Georgetown, done forever. Aspen, done forever. They're all gone. Railroads shut down, investors stopped coming in, smelters quit. Miners are finished. Now, before we go on, how, how are we doing on time? 7.55 already? We got to take a break. Everybody come on up, take a look at the books. Five minute break. We're coming back. Before we get over to Irwin, everybody, and I'm making my way to Crested Butte. And uh, I can guarantee you, if we come in here next time, we're going to be on Crested Butte, but I'm setting the stage right now. So before we go on and get over to Irwin, I want to give you the characteristics of a load mining camp in the Gunnison country, on the western slope, and in the west, and dispel a few misconceptions. Number one, a good friend of mine at Fort Lewis College, Dwayne Smith, has written a book called The Rocky Mountain Frontier. And he says that, and this is number one characteristic, that all mining camps exhibit characteristics of an urban frontier. A lot of people look at a mining camp and say, man, out in the boondocks, out in the middle of nowhere. No. It is not like a bunch of farmers living out in Nebraska 20 miles away from each other. Anytime you put 5,000 people together in one spot at one time, that is urban city, urban characteristic. Number two, all mining camps lack self-sufficiency. Miners always like to say that, boy, they're rough, rough, hardy individualists and they could uh, produce everything. Couldn't produce anything. The only thing, two things they could produce was meat and wood. And when they shot the hell out of the deer and the elk and they clear cut all the timber for mine props and railroad ties and cabins, they didn't even have that. And they couldn't produce any food because most of them were nine, ten thousand feet where you, you just couldn't do it. Here's the common denominator. For every miner you have in a mining camp, it took five people to supply them. Going to the farmers, to the railroaders, to the freighters, to the whatever. Five to one. Thirdly, all mining camps had a speculative gambling instinct. There is only one reason that anybody would be at Irwin, Colorado with 40 feet of snow, 20 degrees below zero temperatures in the middle of nowhere, and that is the chance to get rich. And in all of the letters that I've read on these miners out in the West and in the Gunnison country, I can quote exactly what they're saying. They're just saying, as soon as I hit it, I'm back home to Indianapolis. They want to get home to their wives. They want to get home to a, a life where you don't have to freeze your ass every day of the year. Number four, all mining camps are very cosmopolitan. Every mining camp probably had 15 different languages spoken. They were from Mexico, New Zealand, Australia, Missouri Valley, Alaska, Canada. They came from everywhere. And cosmopolitan means a very high civilization, culture diffusion, mixing with different groups of people. I always tell my class the opposite of that is provincial. I grew up in a Belgian farming community, everybody off the boat, and that's all I knew for 18 years was the Belgian way of doing things. Didn't have any contact with anybody else. Then I came, after my graduate school days were over, growing up in a community where everybody spoke in a clicked, clipped accent or they didn't speak English at all, I come up to Crested Butte and I say I'm home. Because they were all speaking either a foreign language or they spoke with a clipped accent. I love those guys. They just came from a different area. I came from Belgium, they came from Austria, Italy, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, and so on. Number five, all mining camps exhibited an extractive nature. And here's what I say about mining camps in the Gunnison country and elsewhere. 
The more ore you take out of the ground, the less ore is left in the ground, and when all of the ore is taken out of the ground, the mining camp dies. So all mining camps have a very short existence. Now you say, now Bannabush, you're losing it. What about Aspen? What about Telluride? What about Breckenridge? What about Crested Butte? Any of those got mines operating? Hell no, they're all ski areas. Tourist areas. Number six, all mining camps resemble what I call a herky-jerky frontier. There's an old expression, gold is where you find it, but silver is in ledges, which means you can find gold anywhere. They mined it on the beaches of Nome, Alaska. They found it in an extinct volcano at Cripple Creek and Victor. But silver is always found in consistent formations. And any time you got iron on the top of the ground, you got a good chance of finding silver. Number seven, all mining camps produce residue. And by residue, I mean this. When the mining camps die, the supply towns survive. So the mining towns in the Gunnison country died. Gunnison survived. Crested Butte survived. Why? Because Crested Butte and Gunnison are railroad towns, supply towns, and smelter towns. They didn't have all their eggs in one basket. Now remember, I'm talking only about precious metal mining right now. We're not over to coal yet. Number eight, all mining camps solve problems quickly and pragmatically. We don't have time to be screwing around with trials when somebody is accused of claim jumping or murder. When the miners come down from the mines on Saturday afternoon, there's a trial held. And the guy is convicted and uh, he's going to be tarred and feathered or if he's gonna, it's murder, he's going to get hung. And if he's going to be tarred and feathered, the guy gets a little huffy and says, well, I'll take this to the Colorado circuit. I say, Harry, get the rope. What the hell you mean you're going to appeal this to whatever? You got two options. You get your ass out of town or we're going to hang you. Which is it going to be? You got eight seconds. We got mineral to mine. We are not spending a lot of time on trials. Animus Forks, Colorado, 11,200 feet. Above Silverton, shadows of engineer and cinnamon passes. Animus Forks newspaper said one time, there'll be no appeals from this court because this court is the highest court <laughs> in the nation at 11-2. Number nine, we talked about this a little last time, the federal government is very important with regard to mining camps. Subsidizing railroads, subsidizing stage lines, setting the price of gold and silver high enough to where miners can make money off of it, building irrigation projects, building reservoirs. Federal government did a lot for the miners. And obviously, when silver dropped, it didn't do very good for the silver miners. Number 10, all mining camps are very intolerant. I laugh when I read books and say, well, the mining camps are a real exhibit of democracy. They did not like Mexicans. And that is because of racial matters involving the Mexican War. Didn't like them. Mexican didn't like the Anglos either. They did not like Indians. Who the hell do those guys think they are living on land that we could mine? The only good Indian's a dead Indian. Kill them. They did not like Mormons. And they didn't like Mormons because on the Oregon Trail, the Mormons had proved to be very fast and shady businessmen. By the time you got to Salt Lake City or near Salt Lake City on the Oregon Trail, it's pretty obvious that Aunt Martha's dresser isn't going to make it out to Oregon. And the Mormon said, we'll give you a buck and a quarter for it. Take it or leave it. You got to take it. 
bad reputation. And on top of that, they did not like Mormons coming in with four wives <laughs> when they maybe had a scramble for one hour with Kitty the bitch. <laughs> Those guys are a bunch of damn gluttons with four of them. And on top of that, they did not like Orientals. Because if an Oriental Chinese guy came into a camp, they could make money, more money than they could ever make in China, even by making a little bit. So they gave the mining camp a bad reputation because the indication was if an Oriental came into the mining camp, it's starting to slide. Now, if he wants to run a laundry, they want to run a boarding house, they want to be a cook, that's okay, but they can't be mining. Now, the interesting thing about mining camps is that, and, and this will be a shocker for you, one miner out of eight and one cowboy out of eight was black in the West. No stigma attached to a Negro or a black in a mining camp. His money is as good as anybody else's. So amazingly, the one that probably has more discrimination against them today had practically none then. And lastly, in the mining camps of the Gunnison country and elsewhere, failure is common. Mining camps, they said, are meeting grounds for failures. Now, I'll give you a good analogy of what I'm talking about here. Uh, I'm looking for somebody to hire in the mining camp, and I come up to the gentleman right here, and this guy, I look at his resume, and his resume is he graduated from Harvard, a uh, very successful career. Everything goes good. He's one candidate. I walk over to the young lady right here and I look at her resume, born under mysterious circumstances in Schenectady. Nobody knows what she did until the age of 18, <laughs> we can probably guess. <laughs> Who am I going to hire? Well, hell, I'm going to hire her, of course. Why am I going to hire her? She has failed enough to where the law of averages says she is due. This guy has succeeded all over the place. He's ready to fail. There is no stigma attached to failure. It is understood that mining is high risk. Horace Tabor failed for 15 years. Winfield Stratton failed for 15 years, and then they ultimately hit it. Enough on the characteristics of the mining camp. We now go to Irwin. Now, before we go to Irwin, people, anybody, this is at the Western State Library. Irwin, my wall Borneman silver camp of the Ruby Mountains, great pictures, well illustrated, nicely written, great bibliography. All you got to do is go to the main desk and say, I'd like to check this out, and go to the special collections room. You can't take it out of the library. Is anybody interested in Irwin? This is the last word on Irwin. Let's go to Irwin probably the greatest of all the silver camps in the Gunnison country. The major route into Crested Butte in the late 1870s was not via today's Highway 135. It wasn't the main route until the railroad ran along 135. The major route was from Gunnison up Ohio Creek, over Ohio Pass, and into Irwin. Shorter, 26 miles to the top of the pass. Another what, three into Irwin maybe? 29 miles that way, 37 the other way. So that's the major route into Irwin. Irwin was the place where all the supplies were going in the early days. Big freighters like David Wood and J.C. McClure had dozens of four-horse teams running between Alamosa. Alamosa is where the Rio Grande Railroad arrived in 1878. So David Wood and J.C. McClure and Otto Mears would have their wagons get the supplies from the railroad, take it over Cochito Pass, right through where Gunnison is, up Ohio Creek, and usually deposit it at a place called Skinnerville, 
just before you assaulted Ohio Pass? How long would it take us? Probably, I'm just going to guess four or five days. You know, I could imagine with those wagons they might make, it might be more than that, maybe 10 miles a day. Depending on the terrain, you go over a pass, I mean, it's even less than that. I mean, more time is what I'm saying. So that's where the freight was dumped. And it was named, Skinnerville was named for Jim Skinner, a big mercantile guy from Irwin. From there, early in the spring, March, guys on snowshoes, we call them skis today, with 100 pounds on their back, carried freight into Irwin, usually leaving at 2 to 3 o'clock in the morning when the snow was hard. You want to be breaking through. The greatest freighter in the history of the Gunnison country was a guy named David Wood, operating Crested Butte, operating the Gunnison country. Later on, two of David Wood's daughters wrote a book about him, and it's a title is from a famous story about Dave Wood. Uh, Dave Wood is in the mountains of the Gunnison country one day, and a young lady, about 23 years old, walked up and said, Sir, you've been in these parts long. And David Wood eyed her with contemptuous disdain and said, Madam, I hauled these mountains in here. <laughs> That's the name of the book. Greatest freighter of them all. So I'm going to take a moment and tell you a little bit about him. He was in the Civil War as a bugle boy at 10. He's the only kid I ever knew, or never knew of, that when he was in the fourth grade and he said to the teacher, I got to be excused this morning, and she said, why? He said, I got to go and pick up my Civil War pension check. <laughs> Name any other kid that's going to say that and be accurate. When he got out of the war, he went on a farm with his family in Kansas, and when the farm went under, he began to trail cattle on the Chisholm Trail. From there, he came to Fort Garland, and he started up an, a freight and express company, operating out Fort Garland and going into Lake City, and then eventually over into Crested Butte. In the early 1880s, David Wood was always one step ahead of the railroad. So wherever the railroad end of track was, that's where Dave Wood's wagons were. The roads were terrible. Spring of the year, mud. Summer, dusty and uh, washboardy. Winter, <laughs> you couldn't move in the winter. There's no way you can really travel in the winter. Although, I shouldn't say that completely. I got a surprise for you people a little later. <laughs> David Wood was based in Montrose, and he soon became the top freighter in western Colorado. He grossed, in 1880, $100,000 a month in 1880. By 1892, the railroad had come. Silver panic had hit. And Dave Wood went broke. He lost everything except his ranch at Dallas. And I'm not talking about Texas. How many people in this class have been near downtown Dallas? Where do you think Dallas is? It's uh, between um, Ridgeway and Telluride. Very good. Dallas is about three miles north of Ridgeway. And Dave Wood had a big ranch there, and that is why. What's the name of that pass again that goes from Ridgeway to Telluride? Dallas. Dallas Divide. Named for Dallas Creek in the area. So Dave Wood lived the rest of his life on his ranch, and he died at the age of 93 in the year 1944. One of the greatest of them all. He is a guy who reminded me a lot of Ben Holiday. Ben Holiday is the greatest freighter in the history of the West. He and Woods, trains ran on time, they had honest men, uh, it was just perfect. And Ben Holiday was talked about by Mark Twain in a great book called Roughing It. And it's a great story. 
In Roughing It, Mark Twain talks about an old-timer is very religious visiting the Middle East. And he runs into a young guy about 22 years old named Jack who had never been there before. And here's how the conversation went. The old guy says, Jack, do you see that range of mountains over yonder that bounds the Jordan Valley? The mountains of Moab, Jack, think of it, my boy, the actual mountains of Moab renowned in Scripture history. We are standing face to face with those illustrious crags. And for all we know, dropping his voice impressively, our eyes may be resting at this very moment upon the spot where lies the mysterious grave of Moses. Think of it, Jack. Moses who? <laughs> Moses who? Jack, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You ought to be ashamed of such criminal ignorance. Why, Moses, the great guide, soldier, poet, and lawgiver of ancient Israel. Jack, from this spot where we stand, Egypt stretches a fearful desert 300 miles across. And across that desert, that wonderful man brought the children of Israel, guiding them with unfailing sagacity for 40 years across the sandy desolation and among the obstructing rocks and hills and landed them at last safe and sound within sight of this very spot. And where we now stand, they entered the promised land with anthems of rejoicing. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing to do, Jack. Think of it. Forty years, 300 miles, hell-bent holiday would have had them through there in 46 hours. <laughs> Who the hell is this guy? Moses. He could never run a good freight line. Jack, obviously, missing the point a little bit. Just kind of missed the point, which is easy to do. <laughs> the only place that one could rest between Gunnison and Irwin and Crested Butte was a place called King's Ranch. I've got the only picture I've ever seen of King's Ranch, and I love this place, and I'm, I'm, one of the, these days I'm going to do a pretty big article on it, but there's not much on it. Uh, King's Ranch was at the foot of Ohio Pass, about five miles from Irwin, 13 miles from Crested Butte, give or take. It was a great location for weary freighters and travelers. So if you're going into Irwin, you had a long day, you don't want to ascend the dam pass, so you get your animals in a corral and they get a bite to eat, and you are able to get a bite to eat and sleep that night, and then early the next morning you head on in to Irwin. During 1879, the hotel there considered of a 12-foot by 15-foot tent an iron cook stove, an Ariosa coffee box for the table, and a bed on the ground across the back of the tent. The bed was made of buffalo robes spread out on a layer of hay. One particular day in the dead of winter, John E. Phillips made his way heading for Irwin and stopped at King's Ranch. He said at that day, and he may have been exaggerating, but it was real cold, 55 below. Nine guys and one woman and one bed. On the hay, buffalo robes. Nobody took any clothes off, that's no problem. But he said there was one big Texas gambler who weighed 300 pounds. And it was agreed when they went to bed that everybody would go to sleep on the right side of their body. And when anybody got too tired to where they had to turn over, they would yell, Spoon! And everybody would turn and go to the left side of their body. But they said that when the gambler turned over, he crowded three people out of the damn blanket. And he said that next morning, he said he almost had roasted to death that night because everybody was cramped in and it was warmer than hell. The menu at King's Ranch included pork, baking powder biscuits with syrup and coffee, three bucks a day for the three meals and one night of lodging. The place was always crowded, so in 1880 they built a frame hotel, and I got a picture of that. During the first winter, the boom slowed down. King, William King, who owned the ranch, moved away, and the snow crushed the hotel the following year in 1881. King's Ranch. Irwin. 
began as a great silver camp with the Ruby Chief, the Venango, the Lead Chief, the Forest King, the Bullion King, one great silver mine after another. By the late fall of 1879, I get this, Irwin had 529 houses. Some were two stories high. It also had a bank and a post office and lots sold for $5,000. And it's unbelievable. The main street ran nearly a mile through narrow Ruby Gulch. We've all been there, right? You got to take the road to the left now, but if you went right up the gulch, it's about a mile up that gulch. Irwin was named for Dick Irwin. Small blonde man, quiet and unassuming, fearless, prospected in the Rockies, been a Pony Express rider, was in the Colorado Territorial Legislature, but he never attended, so they kicked him out. The original name of the lake up there, Roz, you know the original name? Yeah, Brennan. Yeah, after Jim Brennan, a miner. It was named Bre Lake Brennan until the 1940s. More about that a little later on. As people came into Irwin in the early years, in the wintertime, they doing everything they could to get in there in February and March to get the best claims. And some of the old timers would sell them a claim. And there'd be a stovepipe sitting in the snow. And the guy say, well, the cabin is all covered with snow, and we got a couple of good claims down there. And around May, when all the snow began to melt, the damn stovepipe fell over, and there wasn't nothing gone below. <laughs> One of the legendary stories in Irwin well, was booming. Nellie Bly came to visit Irwin. How many people remember who Nellie Bly was? Around the world in 80 days. And John E. Phillips, the editor of the Elk Mountain Pilot, was asked to take Nellie Bly out and show her around and have a little skiing expedition. Nellie Bly had never really been on skis. So she headed downhill and upset. Head down, skis up. They got her upright and everybody was laughing. And Nellie Bly was not accustomed to be laughed at by a bunch of damn hicks out in the boondocks. And she wagged her finger under Johnny e. Phillips' nose and she said, Sir, it is pretty obvious to me that you are no gentleman. And Johnny e. Phillips was equal to the task. He said, Madam, after observing you upsetting in the snow, it is also obvious to me that you are no gentleman. <laughs> he really couldn't see anything, but you know. How are we doing on time? We are out at 8.30. Bartleson is on next week. We hope to see you all here then. Thank you very much. See you next week. Thanks,